in the depths of medical history, there exists a haunting tale that sent shivers down the spines of those who dare to look deeper. It is the story of lobotomy, a dark chapter that unfolded in the pursuit of understanding the human mind. A lobotomy, also known as leucotomy, is a type of psychosurgery that involves cutting or destroying parts of the frontal lobes, the area of the brain responsible for higher cognitive functions such as planning, reasoning and personality. The idea behind the lobotomy was to reduce the symptoms of mental disorders such as schizophrenia, depression and anxiety by severing the connections between the frontal lobes and the rest of the brain. But how did this radical and risky procedure come to be and what were its effects on the people who underwent it? In this video, I will trace the history of the lobotomy from its origin in the 1930s to its decline in the 1950s and beyond. I will also discuss some of the ethical and social issues that surround this controversial practice. Before we begin, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. The first lobotomy was performed in 1935 by a Portuguese neurologist named Aegis Moniz. He was inspired by an experiment conducted by two American neuroscientists, Carlyle Jacobson and John Fulton who had observed that removing parts of the frontal lobes in chimpanzees made them less agitated and more docile. Moniz thought that a similar procedure could help human patients who suffered from severe mental illness that did not respond to other treatments. Moniz's original method involved drilling holes into the skull and injecting alcohol or formalin into the frontal cortex, essentially destroying the brain tissue. He later switched to using sharp instruments called a leucotome which he inserted through holes and moved back and forth to cut through the white matter connecting the frontal lobes to the rest of the brain. He called this procedure leucotomy, from the Greek words for white and cut. Moniz claimed that his leucotomy had positive effects on some of his patients, reducing their agitation, delusions, hallucinations and obsessions. He also claimed that it had not affected their intelligence, memory or personality. However, his evidence was based on subjective observation and anecdotal reports, without any rigorous scientific evaluation or follow-up. In 1949, Moniz was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discovery of the therapeutic value of leucotomy in certain psychosis. However, his award was met with criticism and controversy from many in the medical community and beyond, who questioned the validity and ethics of his procedure. Some even called it a surgical form of euthanasia. Meanwhile, in the United States, a neurologist named Walter Freeman became fascinated by Moniz's work and decided to introduce leucotomy to American psychiatry. Freeman was a charismatic and ambitious doctor who wanted to make a name for himself in the field of mental health. He believed that leucotomy could offer a quick and easy solution for thousands of patients who were languishing in overcrowded and understaffed mental hospitals. However, Freeman was not satisfied with Moniz's technique, which he considered too invasive and time-consuming. He wanted to simplify and streamline the procedure so that it could be performed by any doctor without anesthesia or surgical equipment. He devised a new method that involved inserting a thin metal rod similar to an ice pick through the eye socket and into the brain. He then used a hammer to drive it through the thin layer of bone separating the eye socket from the frontal lobe. He then moved it back and forth to sever the white matter connections as he had seen Moniz do it with his leucotome. Freeman called his procedure a transorbital lobotomy because it went through the orbit or eye socket. He claimed that it was safer and more effective than Moniz's leucotomy because it was avoiding drilling holes into the skull and damaging blood vessels or nerves. He also claimed that it was less traumatic for patients because they did not need general anesthesia or hospitalization. He performed his first transorbital lobotomy in 1946 on a 29-year-old woman named Ellen Ionesco, who suffered from depression and insomnia. Freeman soon became an enthusiastic promoter of his transorbital lobotomy, traveling across the country in his van dub, the Lobotmobile, to demonstrate his technique to other doctors and hospital staff. He also trained his partner, James Watts, a neurosurgeon who had initially assisted him with Moniz's leucotomy method but later became disillusioned with Freeman's transorbital approach. Freeman's transorbital lobotomy gained popularity among psychiatrists who were desperate for an alternative treatment for their patients who did not respond to conventional therapies such as drugs, electroshock, 
or psychotherapy. Many of these patients were considered incurable, violent or disruptive and were often restrained, isolated or subjected to harsh treatments such as insulin coma or metrazole shock. Lobotomy seemed to offer a way to calm them down and make them more manageable. However, lobotomy also had serious and often irreversible side effects. Many patients who underwent lobotomy were left with severe cognitive and emotional impairments such as apathy, passivity, lack of initiative, poor concentration, memory loss and personality changes. Some became unable to function independently and required constant care and supervision. Some developed seizures, infections, hemorrhages or even died as a result of the surgery. The lobotomy procedure also raised ethical and social questions about the rights and dignity of mental patients who were often subjected to the surgery without their consent or knowledge. Many patients were lobotomized against their will or under coercion from their families or doctors. Some were lobotomized for reasons that had nothing to do with mental illness such as homosexuality, criminality or social deviance. Some were lobotomized simply because they were inconvenient or troublesome to others. One of the most famous cases of lobotomy was that of Rosemary Kennedy, the sister of President John F. Kennedy. She was born with a mild intellectual disability and suffered from mood swings and behavioral problems as she grew older. In 1941, when she was 23 years old, her father Joseph Kennedy arranged for her to have a lobotomy without consulting her mother or siblings. The surgery went wrong and left her severely disabled, unable to speak coherently or walk properly. She spent the rest of her life in an institution hidden from the public eye. Another famous case was that of Howard Dilley, who was lobotomized by Freeman in 1960 when he was 12 years old. He was sent to Freeman by his stepmother who disliked him and complained that he was defiant and rebellious. Freeman diagnosed him with schizophrenia and performed a transorbital lobotomy on him without his father's knowledge or consent. The surgery did not affect his intelligence or memory, but it left him emotionally numb and confused. He spent the next few years in various mental institutions and juvenile homes. The popularity of lobotomy began to decline in the 1950s and 1960s with the introduction of new antipsychotic drugs such as chloropromazine also known as thorazine, which proved to be more effective and less harmful than lobotomy in treating mental disorders. The public also became more aware of the dangers and abuses of the lobotomy through media reports and exposés. The last recorded lobotomy in the United States was performed by Freeman in 1967 on Helen Mortensen, who died of a brain hemorrhage shortly after the surgery. Today. Lobotomy is widely regarded as a barbaric and unethical practice that should have never been performed. However, some historians and scholars have argued that lobotomy should be seen in its historical context as a desperate attempt to help patients who had no other options at that time. They also point out that some patients did benefit from lobotomy and reported improved quality of life after the surgery. Some forms of psychosurgery are still performed today for certain conditions that do not respond to other treatments such as severe OCD or chronic pain. These procedures are much more refined and precise than lobotomy, using advanced techniques such as stereotactic surgery, radiofrequency ablation or deep brain stimulation. They are also done with the informed consent of the patient and under strict ethical guidelines. Lobotomy is a fascinating and disturbing chapter in the history of medicine that reveals how far we have come in our understanding and treatment of mental illness. It also reminds us the need for constant vigilance and critical thinking when it comes to new medical interventions that promise quick fixes for complex problems. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something new and interesting about lobotomy. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And if you want to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to my channel.